<laughs> Hi, welcome to ML UX. We're so excited you're here. Wow. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Julia, who's going to tell us a little bit about getting images. And these are both for you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> All right, this will work. Wow, this is a big crowd. Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy you're here at the Seattle Getty office. Um, I'm really excited to hear the talks today. Um, just a quick intro and a little bit about Getty Images. So I'm Julia. I'm the director of product globalization. And what that means is that me and my team work with uh, UX, dev, marketing, all sorts of stakeholders in the company to make sure that everything that we do, our websites, um, our products are <clears throat> world ready, which means we can localize them, we can uh, adapt them to local cultures and, um, and make the, all the imagery that we license worldwide available to people who speak different languages and live in different countries. I'm also very involved with the Diversity and Inclusion Committee here in the Seattle office and as part of that, I've been working on how ways that we can really showcase and surface all the amazing breadth and depth of images that we do have so that we can give everybody the images that they're looking for or that they don't even know that they're looking for uh, <clears throat> and, and really show the world as it is in its full glory. Um, a few words on Getty. So, this Seattle office is our headquarters. We also have uh, large offices in London, New York, and Calgary. And then we have another like 30 some offices worldwide, smaller offices. We <clears throat> have 1,700 employees in these areas. We have 275 plus million images and videos that can be licensed through our websites. Um, we have 100 staff photographers. We have 80,000 exclusive contributors of creative content and then a bunch more other contributors. So we have a lot of metadata. This is for this audience. So much <laughs> metadata. So many search challenges. <laughs> how do we get, uh, how do we find, get, allow people to find the image that they want among all those 275 million? So a little bit about our mission. We really believe in moving the world with images. So that means the power of imagery to ask the hard questions, to challenge attitudes and stereotypes, and to shine light on all the furthest corners of the world or what's happening there. So our staff photographers are in war zones. <clears throat> They're in um, at the border crossing. They're at elections. They're at the Oscars. They're all over, wherever there's something to, newsworthy going on, we have our photographers there. And then, like I said, our creative uh, photographers are 80,000 strong all over, shooting different, um, all, any imaginable creative image that you can think of. And um, I wanted to highlight just a couple of creative partnerships that we have. So we have the Lean In partnership with leanin.org that's been going for about six years. So it show, it's a collection of thousands of authentic images showing women, girls, families, and men the way we really are uh, and not outside of basic of gender stereotyped um, uh, roles. Um, also, we have a more recent collection, the Show Us Collection, a partnership with Dove and um, Girl Gaze, that is the largest stock photo library created by women and non-binary individuals to shatter stereotypes of beauty and to show us as we really are and not how others believe we should be. You can find it on Instagram with the hashtag show us uh, or on our sites with the hashtag show us. Um, and I encourage you to check it out because it's a really great, great collection. And I have a quick video. Yeah, Craig's turning down the volume. <laughs> um, uh, just a very short video that is following on on this, really the power of imagery to move the world. Think about what moves you. A moment. An emotion. A memory. 
story, a connection to something real, maybe to something unexpected. We believe in the power of visuals, to ask the questions, to press the issues, to challenge attitudes, to smash through stereotypes. For 25 years, we've collaborated with the world's best photographers, videographers, creative researchers, and the industry's top talent with unmatched access and unique perspectives. We focus our lens on what's right in the world, what demands attention, and what we aspire to. From the commercial to the eye-opening, revenue generating, to society changing, market disrupting, to headline driving. From the world's biggest stages to the far reaches of the globe, everything we do is to ensure we have the perfect visual, that it's easy to find and that it makes a connection. Creative, editorial, archival, custom, has the power to move you and move the world it does. And that's the, this is on. Hello. Hello. Now, no, yes. Uh, best of all, we're hiring. So come work with us, find your flock, as we say. Um, we have data scientists, machine learning, data scientist position, machine learning engineers, UX researchers, product designers, software engineers. Um, there is a number of Getty folks here in the audience today, so um, find us after the talks, and uh, we're happy to... That's me, come talk to me. <laughs> maybe, maybe all, or a lot of the Getty folks could raise their hands. <laughs> Look around, there's some Getty folks. So if you're interested in any of these, uh, uh, come find me, come find somebody, and um, or look it up on, on Jobbyte. All right, thank you. Thank you. Who do I hand off to? Thank you so much. Also, can you believe your coworkers can be these penguins? This is amazing. Um, no, but thank you so much, Julia. And I, I can't stress enough the cool work that um, y'all are doing here. I mean. Andrea and I went to grad school together, so I'm like obviously a huge fan, but Andrea's been sharing all the cool things that Getty Images is getting into. Cannot wait for your talk to kind of share out a little bit of that too and invite you to be part of this team that is doing a lot of really great work in terms of like showing up and, and what does diversity in image sets actually look like uh, and so much more. So uh, cool, thank you Julia for sharing that. Um, cool, I know what some of you are thinking, awesome, this is great, I'm so inspired, but like what is machine learning in US? Uh, that's kind of like why I'm here at Down School, but wait, no. Um, so just kind of high level, how I like to describe it is, you know, we look at how data can inform and drive U.S. design decisions, so using data science techniques, machine learning methods, but also how we design experiences that make it transparent, what is actually happening to your data, how to make it transparent what the model knows, what it doesn't know, how do you give feedback to the system and everything too. Um, so that tends to be roughly what we talk about at our events. Uh, also, for those of you who are in the audience and don't know, UX is so much more than design um, and just making things look pretty. I am a UXer, but you don't want me designing anything. Look at these slides, they're black and white. Um, it's interaction design, it's UX research, information architecture, voice user interface design, so much more. Um, also, data, so much more than just like, oh, machine learning, AI, there's data analysis, there's stats. Um, Artificial intelligence is a part of it, um, but really there's a ton of techniques and methods within the data realm as well as the UX realm and how do we use them together to create better products for people, uh, more usable machine learning. So when these come together, they make fantastic experiences like these. These are just a couple gifts of my favorite examples of usable machine learning. Um, also sorry for all the data scientists in the room being like, these are very visual. Um, tends to be the machine learning that I'm excited about. It's like lots of code and that's like less exciting to look at. Um, but uh, we have the Pinterest visual search on the left where like 
I have no idea what they're searching for, but somehow they can reseed the search by clicking on the pizza, which I think is fantastic. They don't have to go back up to the search bar, right? Computer vision is all like, no, don't worry, we got you. For every image, we're going to populate at least a couple more, and then you can easily reseed it. What? Well, so smart. Great. Um, NLP stuff, like Google type in a keyboard, and it already knows when parties should be a gift. That's one that I love. Um, and then, of course, really great creative experiences like with Draw and Auto Draw. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg of the cool things that we talk about. Um, so, you might be wondering, what do you do here at MLUX? I'm on board, love machine learning and UX. Um, our goal with this meetup is really to create a collaborative environment between UX, data science, and everyone in between. Um, we aim to organize a community that helps foster cooperation, creativity, and learning across these disciplines. And our goal is to create a space to discuss human-centered machine learning and share ideas and resources. Um, I'm up here, I'm holding the mic, I organize this. I come from computational neuroscience, now I work as a UXer. Um, I am here saying I am not an expert in machine learning in UX, like there's so much more that I, I have to learn too, and all of us in the room are an expert in something, and so um, our, our goal is to get all the folks here who are interested, passionate about something, talking to other interested, passionate folks, because that's how we move the industry forward, is by learning and growing together um, instead of in silos. So, that's our vision. Hey, what up? Welcome, Seattle. Um, how do we actually do that? Yeah, great question. So we host regular tech talks like this, um, panels focused on data science, ML, AI, as well as UX design, focused on really sharing those best practices. Like a win for me is that you are so excited about the things that you saw in the talk today that you go back to your team stand up tomorrow and you're like, I don't even want to talk about my project. Like I want to talk about this amazing talk that I saw. It was so inspiring. Why aren't we doing this in our team? Like this is so cool. And you know the whole way to approach this. Like. Yes, that's a win for me. That's my success metric. Um, yeah, so we, we also organize semi-regular networking and happy hours too, really, so that way you all can meet each other in the community. So like I mentioned, we're kind of piloting this in New York and Seattle. So we did host one in New York um, at, with Spotify at the World Trade Center um, in October. That was pretty successful, so we're going to have another one back in New York. If you have any friends in New York, tell them, hey, what up? This is fun. Um, and if this one goes well, I don't know, there's a pretty good turnout. Maybe. Seattle, if you all want one again, let me know. Hey, what up? Um, so high level, um, for those of you who have not been to past events and everything too, uh, this is kind of like a smattering of what we did back in 2019. Um, really, you can tell that we're kind of all over. We work with small companies, we work with <laughs> large companies. We work on startup incubators to, you know, how do we use uh, unsupervised learning methodology in order to inform data-driven personas. That was this amazing talk at Salesforce. You should totally look into it. Uh, definitely moving away from uh, uh, K-means clustering and like hierarchical clustering into principal components analysis and then how do you couple that with qualitative research? Ooh, ah, I know, you're all like sitting on the edge of your chair, right? Ooh, so cool. Don't worry, you're more interested in design. That's fine, we talk about multimodal design. Um, how do we actually make better experiences? AI for social good, all that stuff. So uh, really a lot of different samples and um, trying to, to share out those best practices across these domains. Make sense, cool? Yeah, so um, we've been going for about two years over two years. We're on our third year. So we've been going for a little over two years. Um, and we've had the pleasure of working with a bunch of different companies and groups and, and speakers and everything too. Um, yeah, so this too can be us. Ooh, ah, we're having this much fun, right? Yeah, we did it. Um, yeah, so uh, you want to get in contact with us? Great. Oh, we're so excited. If you have cool articles that you want to share, you have questions, you just have these fun gifts that you're like, this totally captures ML and UX. Um, totally tweet at us. We're at MLUX Meetup, um, and that's for uh, Seattle, San Francisco, and New York, too. So all in one place. Come join us. Um, you might have found us on meetup.com. If not, we're also posting our events there, meetup.com slash MLUX Meetup. I know it's really hard to search on meetup.com, so I'm going to put the URL here in big. So ta-da, it's here. Um, but that's not the only place where we post our talks. After the fact, you saw my very professional screen recording. Um, we do try to upload our slides and everything too onto our YouTube channels because so many folks are interested who can't physically be here with us. Um, as well as like we'll do live tweets or tweet out um, articles. We sometimes do medium posts and everything too about our events and we'll tweet that out. So, hey, follow us. Um, this is a fellowship project uh, from the Center for Technology Society and Policy, as well as the Algorithm McFerrin and the Opacity Working Group. Oh, that's right. Um, I know they're both right off the tongue. Um, but they're at UC Berkeley. They're great. They gave us money to actually do this. That pays for you know the overhead in terms of like paying for meetup.com subscriptions and everything too. 
Um, but if you're interested in sponsoring us further, and that includes getting speakers who otherwise would not be able to come up to the stage and share their, their thoughts and insights, consider uh, supporting us on Patreon. Um, we are a nonprofit. Woohoo! Um, so see me about that if, you, if you're interested. But hey, we have seven patrons. $37 per event. Ooh, ah. So we just started that this year because our fellowship money is running out. Thanks, Berkeley. But yeah, so check us out there. Donate whenever you get a ticket. Remember, these events are free to allow everyone access, but we'd also love to allow other speakers access. So food for thought. Um, yeah, we have a code of conduct. Uh, you can check it out, bit.ly, M-L-U-X, C of C. I'm not going to go into it, but please be nice to each other. And please do let me know if there's somebody or something making you uncomfortable. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, oh, ah, uh, we actually compiled a resource list, bit.ly, MLUX resources, list of a bunch of different teams, companies, methods in this area. So if you want to dive in deeper on like data visualization, like awesome, there's an article for that, or oh, how do, you know, you mentioned the, the data-driven personas, where do I read more? That article's on this list, ooh, ah. So definitely take a look there. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, that being said, we are big in meeting people, so I'm going to turn it back to you. Uh, you have three minutes or so, turn to someone next to you who you did not come with, not your friend, and say hi, meet someone. <laughs>
event, but I, I sincerely hope that this event doesn't end with the 9 p.m. kick out tonight. Um, I hope that you really do get to meet someone who's cool and inspires you, and you get to go grab coffee or something because these aren't super frequent in Seattle, so like it's up to you to keep the community going. There you go. Yes. So, so really um, take this time, meet other cool folks, and um, that's what we're all about, and just get inspired by their cool work. Thank you. Um, on that note, uh, FYI, we can't well, do anything without you, so we're very community driven. So if you are a designer working in machine learning, if you're a data scientist that has some problems around experiences, we want to hear from you, so feel free to drop me an email. Um, oh, my email's not on there. MLUS Meetup is also us. Here it is. Um, also, if you are a sponsor or you want to give us a venue, awesome, we love that. Uh, we also need people who want to give talks. Ooh, shout out to Andrea and Josh. Thank you for giving talks. Um, we need volunteers. No MLUX experience needed. Shout out to all of our amazing volunteers. Thank you for doing that. Um, also, if you have like, feedback, like, oh, wait, we prefer doing whatever. Like, come to me. And then I might be like, great, you do it. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you're interested, contact humans at MLUXSF. I know this was not good planning. We used to be only in SF, now we're at Meetup, hence the whole like we're MLUX Meetup, but that's the name <laughs> domain we got. So humans at MLUXSF.com. We're the human side of it, get it? This is is joke, it's funny. You're welcome. Um, so now you won't forget, and it goes to a whole scenario of us and we'll assign it. So um, contact us, say hi, we're cool. Come say hi afterwards. Um, yeah, so on that note, we are gonna start our lightning talks. Uh, we have, just a reminder, if you are coming in late, uh, we do questions a little bit differently. Get on your phone, go to our Twitter account, at MLUX Meetup, and if you have questions throughout the talk, be like, oh, that's a great point that I have in my head and I want to ask it, but we don't have a microphone being passed around, so I'm going to tweet at it. Um, so tweet at MLUX Meetup. These are also the handles with our, our two speakers. Um, and then I will, in the Q&A panel after the fact, I will go through those and I will ask some of those for questions. Sound good? Yes? Yep. Yes. yes. Good idea. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and also for recording's sake, we don't pass around the mic because it just takes forever. So, tweet your question. Um, so, I'm so excited to now hand it over. Okay, this is done with my part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, fine, fine. And now we actually get to hear and learn these best practices from two amazing individuals. Um, we're going to start with Andrea and move to Josh. But, um, Andrea, I'd love to hand it over to you and just hear about the cool stuff you work on here at Getty. Thank you. Big, big thank you to Michelle for coming and having an MLUX in Seattle and doing it here at Getty and getting all of you to come. This is amazing. So thank you for everyone for coming. Um, so Julia had showed the video earlier about Getty images and the impact that our images have in the world. Sometimes impact we want and other times impact we don't want. So I'm going to be talking today about machine learning and data in this societal context. Um, I'm not going to give many answers or solutions. I'm just going to talk about some ideas and hope that it spurs on some questions and discussions and hope that all of you can bring your ideas because there's some of these topics are kind of sensitive and there's no one right or wrong answer. It's more getting as many voices as we can in the conversation and we want to hear from you on what you think on some of these topics after the fact. So biases and imagery is where I'm gonna start. What do I mean by that? So I'm gonna start with an example. These are images from a GQ article a couple of years ago called The Style of Climbing. And what do you notice about the images? You have these really strong, burly men who are doing some really impressive climbing moves. The man on the top is doing this planking, the man off to the side is doing, holding his body up in some crazy horizontal way. Um, and the women are just sitting back, uh, sitting in the sun, drinking a beer, watching. So Outdoor Research, um, some of you probably know as a local sports company, they were pretty offended by the GQ article, so they decided to build a parody one where they reversed the stereotype. And they, took, they went out to Eastern Washington and took the same exact photos. You have the woman doing the impressive flanking move, the woman holding her body out sideways, and the men are just sitting there in the sun drinking their beer and watching. So this is to illustrate the type of stereotype that I want to talk about here. This 
Um, flipping of, of genders against, or we, we have stereotypes that are uh, perpetuated over and over again because we hear stories, we see examples of some stereotype out in the world. And we get so used to it that we kind of forget what the opposite looks like. And there's even um, like a bias here. This is illustrating this male and female gender binary, which ignores all the other types of genders that might be interested in climbing. Uh, this is something that's going to continue throughout the talk um, in that way. So, so taking that example to Getty. So this is our search results that come back from a given search. So if you search for the word nurse, this is what the top of the page looks like. If you look closely, you might see that there's a lot of females. This may not surprise many of you uh, because the nurse uh, industry, nursing industry, there's a lot of female nurses out there. And in our search results, Getty has 76.7% female nurses. And you compare that to the US Census in 2019 had 88.2 80, female, female nurses. So it brings up the question of what should the Getty percentage be? Should it be showing an objective representation of the world that we see out there? Or should it be more balanced in some way to be more inclusive of all the different types of people that can take on that profession? So let's assume for the rest of the talk that we want to create some, we want to have fewer females and more genders as a part of those search results. So I'm going to walk through two different approaches. One of them is, or both of them have pros and cons to them, and we're going to kind of talk through what those risks and benefits are. So one approach. Uh, all of our images have keywords on them. So the top image of a man has a keyword, men photos. Uh, the bottom image of a woman has a keyword woman. And these keywords come directly from model releases that every subject that's in one of our images signs when they get their picture taken. So you have, uh, they give their name, their birth date, their gender, and their ethnicity. And we can then translate that into a keyword that then is tied to the images. So one thing that we could do is we could take all of this data and somehow try to uh, uh, be more prescriptive about the number of male and female and other gender photos that we have in the search results. We could do that for gender, we could do it for ethnicity, we could do it for uh, body type, body shape, income level. There's a lot of different dimensions of ethnicity that, which we could populate these results from. And so in this case, it would look like this, slightly more balanced. So what are the risks in a, in a solution like this? So one of them is the model release user experience. So when someone types in the model, or when someone is filling out the model release, they may not be comfortable revealing what their gender is. They may not be comfortable uh, with, maybe English isn't their first language and they don't know exactly what ethnicity to represent them or they aren't comfort comfortable saying so. So there's things that can fall down in filling out that form in the first place. There's also the uh, translating uh, the user experience where images are uploaded as well as these model releases. Uh, if that UI isn't easy and fluid and intuitive, then we get a case where we often drop the data and we don't get the data, which limits the amount of coverage that we have on our images, which then poses this problem where we can't balance the search results in a way that we might want to. Another piece here is uh, some data is often uh, underrepresented or, or over, over, um, over indicated or underindicated. So uh, for example, often an image of a person, uh, it's more likely that it has an ethnicity keyword that's not Caucasian because Caucasian is seen as the default, so somebody will not add that piece of data thinking that it's not necessary to add. So the other risk in a solution like this is that it can be pretty prescriptive. So I showed in that screen, there's the, the idea of slotting in male. Um, you have to define what percentage that is. So 50% male, uh, are you defining 50%? Are you defining the percentage that's aligned with the census? 
Uh, what's that percentage in the US versus in Japan? Uh, what is that, does that number change for different users? If a user is, shows that they really like to see a lot of different genders and a lot of different ethnicities, should we uh, change that percentage for them or personalize to them in some way? There's also the question of if we have percentages for uh, gender and then we also have percentages that we're trying to meet for, match for ethnicity, as well as ability type, as well as body shape, uh, as well as sexual orientation. There's only uh, six slots in the top above the fold, and how do we determine which, uh, which dimension of diversity or which type of diverse person gets to be in those spots? And then the third risk is that this method really relies on categories. So we have every person gets bucketed into a category. And yes, they self-identify into a category, but at the end of the day, they may not exactly align with the, with the predetermined categories. So what's another possible approach? So we, all of you probably know about computer vision models that will detect faces. So this here is a computer vision model that will look across pixels, find the features of a face, put a bounding box around that face. And what it can do is it can have a mathematical representation of the face. So you see here, the man's face uh, is represented by an embedding or a vector, which is a series of numbers. Um, and the, the face of the woman is represented by a different vector. And what these representations, mathematical, uh, let us do is come up with a distance where we can measure the distance between these two faces. So a man's face, uh, he's male, he has darker skin tone, uh, and she's a female, she has lighter skin tone, so their faces mathematically in this space are going to be a farther distance than somebody that looks very similar. And so what we can do with a mathematical measure like that is we can look at all the faces in the search results, and we can try to have a wide distribution of different types of distances. So uh, the, the man in the middle, uh, his skin tone and his gender are very similar to the man on the bottom, so they're a close distance, what, 0.3, whereas the man is very far from the woman, both his skin tone and gender, which means the distance is quite far. So you could imagine going across the entire search results page uh, and making sure that you have a wide distribution of those distances. And that's what we see in this graph here, is if there's, uh, for, for one result set for nurse, if there's 2,000 candidate images, the y-axis shows the range of distances between those images. And so we could choose images and select ones that are that give us a wide distribution across the whole page. So some of you have probably heard in the news concerns about facial detection models. So I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna give a toy example for those that maybe don't know how those models work that will explain them a little bit more or hopefully explain them a little bit more. And the toy example is with dogs instead of humans, just because it's easier to talk about. So imagine we have Dan, the data scientist. Dan is a real person. He's right there. <laughs> <laughs> I will be making fun of him. Um, <laughs> so imagine Dan, he really likes dogs. So he wants to go and build a dog detection model. So to build a dog detection model, he needs a lot of images. And the images on Google Images aren't that great. So what he decides to do is go to his personal photo library to find the images. And he has a dog, it's a golden retriever, his name's Mowgli, and you see him here on the left. So he collects all these images, he gathers the ones with Mowgli, and he gathers the ones without Mowgli, and that's his dogs and not dogs labeled training data set. And he goes to train the model, and the model starts to learn features that are common across all of the dog pictures. And so it's looking for patterns in the pixels, and it starts to see that dogs always have floppy ears, dogs always have snouts, and dogs always have shaggy hair. So Dan is really happy with this model, and he goes to test it. 
And what does he find? That it's really good at predicting dogs, this golden retriever, um, but it predicts not dogs, which are all other types of dogs. So dogs with different ears, different eyes, different snouts, different color of hair, different texture of hair. So does this make Dan a dogist? <laughs> So what you can see here with this toy example is that it, it's really not um, Dan sitting in his basement with his hoodie up and he's programming racism in, into these machine learning models, but rather it's the training data that he's gathering and where he's getting it from. And this is the same exact phenomenon that we see with uh, facial detection models. Specifically, these are images from labeled faces in the wild data set, which is a really common and old data set to use in some uh, open source face detection. And what do you notice about all the pictures? They're very male and they're very white. Um, and this is because they were scraped from Yahoo News in early 2000s when it was largely white politicians that were online, predominantly George W. Bush. And so you have a situation where you have um, this historical data that's being used to train models that are used today that still are not well represented. And many of you have probably seen this example, but what you get as a result is the face detection model isn't able to find a face of um, many darker skinned individuals as well as older folks and younger folks. So that little anecdote highlights why this is one of the risks of this type of methodology of relying on computer vision, where you can have a case where you have images and you can't find the person or you can't find the face. And so if we try to use a technology like this, then we're missing out on those photos. And what that means is for our photographers who take those photos, they don't have a chance of making money off of that image, and it means that they're no longer getting money and usually it's the photographers that are friends with this demographic of people that we want to keep um, employed and, and working on finding this really great imagery because they have the connections to the real lives that we're trying to capture. Another big risk here is that uh, I showed before you make this distance calculation. It's kind of weird making a distance calculation between human faces. And it's important to think about like what could be harmful out of that. Um, I don't know if there's a light-skinned uh, Latino woman and a light-skinned Caucasian woman, would they be offended if their faces are seen as similarity in, dis in distance, even if, though they come from very, very different backgrounds? Uh, the other risk is that it's really limited to the face pixels. So diversity is many different dimensions. It's beyond just the face. It's the the whole person and more than just the visual. Computer vision models are really strictly limited to the pixels that we see, and that's very disconnected from uh, who someone can be outside of how they present themselves. For example, this is a self-identified transgender person. Um, the computer vision model wouldn't be able to know that one way or the other strictly based off of the pixels. So really in conclusion, I show these two different approaches. We don't use one or the other right now. We're really still trying to explore and figure out this space. And like I said in the beginning, if you have ideas on how we can think about this conversation better, we definitely want to hear from you. Um, but really where our thinking has been is how do the benefits of what we're trying to do outweigh the risks and how are the benefits for one population of people that's different for the risks for a different population of people? I'm really thinking about uh, who could be harmed by uh, different ways of approaching this problem. And thanks for listening, and thanks, there's a lot of Getty folks in the room who work, have worked on this, so thank you to them for all the thoughtful work. I'm beaming because, of course, Andrea is fantastic and everything too, but this work is so cool. Oh, I'm so happy that you're talking about it. And shout out to Getty for working on important things like this. So super excited. And just thank you for sharing too your process so far and like what y'all are thinking. I just think that it's so important to have conversations like this. So 
for those of us working in computer vision, hey, take a page from this. Cool. Um, that being said, I'd like to introduce our next uh, lightning speaker, Josh Lovejoy. You. Thank you, Michelle. Andrew was super ahead of the game and I had her slides ready beforehand and I was actually planning on doing some stuff about fairness and I'm so happy that she had that ready. I can't not talk about fairness so I'll have a few things there. Um, and I have so many thoughts about what you just talked about. It's such a good question. Um, so uh, real quick, uh, so I'm part of a team called Ethics and Society. We're rather new uh, at Microsoft. We are um, so we're trying to respond to this issue where there are all sorts of principles out there. Many people have thoughts about principles, but the reality of the dilemmas, uh, such as the one that Andrew just walked us through, um, provide a significant amount of space between principle and practice. Um, so we've kind of designed ourselves around a different model rather than vending principles or having sort of a, a high value or a values oriented, high level view of things. We try to partner with teams and get down into the weeds and co-create with them to try to answer questions together. Um, our assumption being that no one sets out to do harm. Really, these are issues of time compression um, and a few other things that we'll talk about in this, or I'll try to cover in this talk. Um, so super high level, uh, we do a lot of different types of stuff. Um, one of the tools in our toolkit that we've been developing is a harms assessment. Um, the difference here being that we, we start with a focus on real impact to human beings, uh, not corporate risk, uh, none of, nothing, nothing about like the product issues that might befall our company, but actually really rooting in people. So that uh, spans a distance between uh, injuries, both physical and psychological, to individuals, all the way out to things about erosions of democratic and societal structures. Um, we build tooling so that we can actually inspect in more of a kind of a conversational nature uh, our relationship between the data and the model, um, doing things where we can um, build unsupervised detection around uh, factors that systemically contribute to model failure, uh, a model drift, when we don't intend it to be that way, right? If you start with a black box model and then ask why did it do the thing that it did, um, oftentimes the answer is, it depends, I need more, I need more questions. So we build in this more conversational way. So it's not a binary fair, not fair, but more like a how do we find where there are heat, where there's heat, uh, and where we can move, move closer towards. Um, we do a ton in the data life cycle. So we have a dedicated team that's all about data collection um, and structure, because ethics, as I'm going to talk about in this example, is about saying what you'll do so you can do what you'll say. And there are big gaps in the former. Um, the example here, when we talk about issues around skin tone, actually what we're talking about often is a calibration issue. Um, white balance, automatic white balance and automatic focus has forever been based on skin tones that look a lot more like mine than like the gentleman in the photo. Um, and that means that as a, as a default, when you use your camera just to take a, a photo without you know, customizing your settings, you will not actually be able to focus for the individual. So what we do is calibrate the environment um, rather than have a human labeler after the fact come in and say, I think that's a black person. Um, we do a ton of user research. Our team, I say as a designer, I am powerless without user research. Um, and because everything we do in this space is all rooted in the human experience um, and then working out of those complex scenarios into the generalizable, um, this is an example of uh, people's perceptions about face recognition. It turns out if you tell people it's about safety, uh, they can get on board with face recognition is which can also be a potentially harmful thing to let the populace know or marketers know about how they can cloy their way into uh, your agreement. So instead, we have to frame it around, again, the utility that is offered to human beings and the notice, disclosure, and consent that we offer them so that we're making a, a real uh, transparent conversation happen. Uh, talk more about that a little bit. We do a lot of UX. Um, I'd say the lion's share of our team is UX. Uh, we're about a 30-person team, growing to about 50. Um, that's unlike anything in the industry right now. Um, so we're doing a lot of making it up as we go along. We are not an ethics body that is about rubber stamping anything. We only take on the work when we actually can dive deeply and do like three, six, nine months engagements where we co-create. Um, and like I said, and these are a few kind of like maybe funny examples, but the one on the left is about how we have clarity and disclosure that you're interacting with a synthetic voice agent. Um, there's a whole project we worked on about the ability to uh, realistically mimic the sound of a person's voice, like a deep fake for voice. 
Um, and how do we responsibly deploy that kind of a thing that really could undermine our ability to trust our own senses? Again, the only way we do it is through transparency and intention. On the right is something kind of funny that maybe we just don't talk about enough, which is uh, what we call a receipt. When you consent to something, the reality is you probably didn't realize what you consented to because there were dark patterns that were in the mix that maybe got you to check a pre-checked box or click a button that said OK, but you don't really know what it meant. So we actually just want to honor the decisions, including the decision not to consent, more stuff like that. We write policy. Uh, we write policy through practice. Again, this is the example in Synthetic Voice. Uh, we've built a gating framework that um, says some people shouldn't be allowed access to technologies that we consider to be harmful. See the <laughs> harms assessment uh, framework from, uh, from earlier. So this has been a whole wacky, zany project of trying to answer questions about like, should people who have passed away have voices synthetically regenerated about them? Like, that seems weird. So we don't allow it. Um, and not because it seems weird, but because there's literally no way a, a person who's passed away in the current moment to have known before they passed away that their voice could have been synthetically regenerated, therefore there could not have been consent, therefore it's not ethical. Um, and we do a ton of training. So we do a whole, a whole focus on how we actually federate out all of these things that we're trying to figure out in practice. Um, this example here is something that comes from what Microsoft calls a core priority. Um, in our organization, we've, um, we've channeled something that, as far as we know, is industry first, which is a requirement that individuals in their performance reviews actually have core uh, priorities that associate with ethics. So they have to declare um, an objective and measurable results that go alongside their career growth and their, the conversations that they have with their managers. Um, and it's elicited all sorts of fantastic conversations like, what? And how? Um, so we're there. And we do a lot of really, really like intense conversations because people are like, I don't want to be doing bad things. I'm not intending to do bad things. I've had people like in these moments of sensitive conversations be like, I think I'm a good person. And we are. We're all trying. But the toolkits aren't there yet. And it's why I'm so thrilled that this kind of a forum has been spun up. Um, so huge kudos again for pulling this kind of community together. Okay, so a little bit of an essay. Um, I feel like we are, we as an industry, and especially as a discipline, a new kind of discipline, are struggling with a specificity problem. So I call this talk Automation on Purpose because I don't think there's enough <coughs> purposeful automation. And more specifically, I think we have three high-level problems that I'm going to talk about. We have an agreement problem, agreeing what we're going to automate. We have a granularity problem, which is the types of automation and the levels of automation that we want to enable and why. And we have an affordance problem, which is we've structured AI and especially generalizable AI as this I'm feeling lucky button that we can press for anything in the world. And in the absence of an affordance, which of course is an obvious thing that invites you to know its function just based on how it presents itself, we don't really have that for most AI systems. They're just, you talk at it and hope that it does the best thing with what you talk at it for. That's a problem from a human-computer interaction perspective. And again, this is a discipline that can bring about change there. So ethics. Ethics is a loaded word. So here's another one, integrity. These things bring about really challenging responses in people um, because they can feel like values judgments. So instead, I'm going to talk about, again, ethics is saying what you'll do so you can do what you'll say. And to underscore that, this is the thing that if I can say one thing I see most often as a, a member of this team, talking with folks across disciplines, across domains, computer vision and speech recognition and mixed reality and all things in, in between, is people have a hard time saying what they intend to do. I think the language is lacking. Many of the folks in this room might have it, so apologies if some of these terms feel like you know, well-trod territory, but I wanted to try to bring it together maybe in a, in a shared vocabulary kind of, kind of spirit. First thing, I think we have an agreement problem. What do I mean by agreement? So um, there's, this there's this term that I discovered. I was doing a bunch of, um, I was doing some policy stuff recently about um, emotion recognition. Um, emotion recognition, a thing that machines can't do because emotions are not something we can label. Emotions are an internalized state. We express ourselves in a way that becomes visual and after we've expressed ourselves, our expressions are interpreted by others, and then, hopefully, two humans communicated without talking using just their brains and their bodies. 
it's crazy, but we are a social species. We live and we die based on our relationships that we form. Social reality is the way that we transform something that is a perceiver independent entity, which I'll describe, into a perceiver dependent entity that has a function associated with it. So what do we mean? Well, an umbrella, we could say, is a perceiver independent entity. It's this thing that has a stick with a sort of a thing on top that somehow covers you. But there's a, there's a context that fundamentally changes the function associated with that thing. Right? So, you know, there was a labeling process a while back where folks in India were labeling uh, umbrellas very differently than folks in California, because in India there's a very different distinction between an umbrella you use for shade and an umbrella you use to, pr to protect yourself from the rain. These are considerations that we have to think about. It's an agreement problem. A rainbow can mean all sorts of different things. It certainly does not mean LGBTQ rights when my kids draw rainbows in their coloring books, but it absolutely means something when I put that laptop sticker on my computer and I want to make sure that there's a, there's a safe space being built up so that folks feel like they don't have to hide their identities at work. That's a context that changes a perceiver-independent thing into a perceiver-dependent function. Um, and this one is one that I, I, I bring, up, uh, bring up the emotion recognition thing because there are companies that want to claim things like the ability to detect anger or fear, and that can be really dangerous. But if you look at something like a yell, a yell can mean something very different in different contexts, right? If a child is yelling to their parent in the park, does that mean they're in danger? No, it probably just means they're being a kid, being, being crazy, and it's, that's good. If you're yelling in a baseball game, that means you're a fan. If you're yelling in a dark street alone at night being chased by somebody, that might be different. Um, so again, all of these things require us to understand context so we can transform a perceiver independent entity into a perceiver, de uh, uh, perceiver dependent, sorry, perceiver independent to a perceiver dependent. And, and if we don't do this thing, then we probably can't train a classifier to be useful in context. Um, my shorthand, because these are very technical terms and sometimes I even bore myself when I say things like this, um, is I want to translate it into uh, something where we're trying to automate a sensory process. So, right, so something that is perceiver independent. Um, and I'll show a little bit of an example of this later on. Um, a sensory process, which we believe is actually just about how well the equipment are performing, versus an intuition process. And if we're doing the latter, then we need a hell of a lot more agreement from a hell of a lot more diversity of the people that are involved. The other thing that I'll talk about, and this, this is kind of where the overlap with, I'm so happy uh, Andrea shared those slides, because this is kind of my shorthand when we talk about, we debate the issues around, do we represent society as it is today when we return something like image results, or do we aspire for a future? Um, and oftentimes in my experience, when I was at Google doing this, these things were always unstated. You know, where we landed with the Google image search team was to say, actually we have to define new policy, and the policy is diversity is a normative good. But what we mean by diversity, being a normative good, means diversity across all these characteristics of diversity. And so it has to be a, a decoupling of these proxy statements like gender and actually go way beyond and say physical attributes, computer vision attributes, all things mixed together. Because if we just say that there's a past that's worth persisting, and we believe that means that we believe something is so good that we can train a classifier to just keep doing that thing over and over and over again. But in most situations where there's a human involved, we probably have to have more clarity about the future state that we aspire towards. Okay, so if there's an agreement issue where we like know what we're trying to build, something that's gonna help us have better intuition or maybe persist a past that may be useful. I think then the next thing, and this has been a big insight for um, our team, is about a granularity issue. Um, AI is just like the world's most generic term. Um, automation in general, the world's most generic term. Um, turns out there are fantastic frameworks for these things, and they come from like the past. So this one in particular, um, which uh, comes from Paris Newman, uh, is one of my favorites. I don't expect you to read all of these things, but I'm just gonna cascade it from most automation. Sounds obvious. The computer does all the things, doesn't check with the people. And from the least automation is the computer offers no assistance to the human totally on their own. And in the middle, you'll see this fascinating breakdown uh, where there are things like, does the system offer the human a choice? Does the, human, does the system offer the human multiple choices? Does the system take action and then give the human a window of time during which to reject the action? This is specificity and granularity that is super useful in so many of our design application processes. 
And yet, we rarely get the chance to inspect or introspect about the models and the performances and what accuracy looks like when we're training these systems. Now, going out from there, we're talking about if those are levels of automation, these are types of automation. And this is the one that I probably lean on the hardest when we're asking a team, what data do you think you're collecting for what purpose? Right? So from the far left, we could say, there's an ability to create an automated system that just does a better job of acquiring information. Right? The cameras that we're holding up, they do a great job of scanning light and gathering pixels. Now, they do some synthesizing. Right? There's an information analysis process that's in the middle where you do things like auto white balance and color correction for the point that we talked about before. That's automation. Right? But does it do anything higher level? Well, not necessarily until you get into Facebook world and then it applies an automatic label to somebody saying this is that person's face. Right? So there's information acquisition, which might just be have you gathered the pixels, up to information analysis, which maybe I think that's a person in those, or maybe a specific person. A recommendation might be, or a decision selection, which is like a recommendation, might be this is what you should do as a result of having identified that person. And finally, it might just do it by yourself. Um, of course, my favorite example of this, slash dystopian example of this, is if you jaywalk in China, it just automatically debits your bank account. <laughs> right? Like that's all four, all up to 10, and it's just smooth sailing. Which means if you ever want to change that law, it's virtually impossible. So you found a past state that you believe is worth persisting, right? So a couple examples of this, and I, you know, there's lots of different ways. Cars and car sensors are a really fascinating one where you can talk about all the information they are gathering. But I love the differences between, say, something that says a self-driving car, uh, which is just like full automation, full all the things, um, versus something that says, hey, it can park for you versus something where when you're backing up, it paints those little lines to show you trajectory, right? And we have all these decisions to make along the way, or you can just beep when you're close to something. These are important distinctions. They're all design decisions that we can make intentionally, as long as we have the language that connects us. Um, one of the ones that I like to, to play with, this is just kind of a personal experiment, is in speech recognition. So um, at the heart of speech recognition, what's happening is the first layer that's being detected are phonemes, right? So we're taking sound, I open my mouth, I say some stuff. There's uh, characteristics of those phonemes, little incremental phonemes that are chunked out, then reunified together, and a confidence threshold is, is, is made about the relationship between those phonetic constituent pieces. And then there's confidence about how, how likely it is that those little phonetic pieces make a word, and so on and so on. So we've done information gathering, then we synthesize it, and then we often have a recommendation about exactly what uh, word to put in place. But we have jargon, and we have dialects, and you have a stuffed up nose one day. And the reality is you get these really useless recommendations and autocorrections that we've all experienced. And then we're left hanging, and I'm gonna talk about this in the affordance problem situation. But you know, in this in this group, we say user studies. We say CSAT, you know, for customer satisfaction. We say DSAT for dissatisfaction. We're left in this spot where actually it, this would be far more useful. I call it kind of the hooked on phonics or practical transcription approach. I think it's far more useful to expose the the failures of the system because they're not really failures. They're just lower layers of abstraction in the synthesis. Okay, so we talked about agreement. Have we stated what we intend to do? We've talked a bit about granularity. What do we intend to do and at what level of automation? And by the way, it doesn't have to be across the board. It can be different levels of automation. So now I want to talk about affordance. So one of the biggest learning moments for me as a designer in this process was doing research with the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, where, um, and actually oddly, the biggest insight came when we had our first participants and they were a no-show. And so we were hanging out with the ASL interpreters. And they let us in on a whole bunch of fantastic details. But one of them that was so crucial was about the relationship forming that happens between someone who is deaf or hard of hearing and their interpreter. You would, I would think, naively, having been new to the area at that moment, that this is like almost plug and play. A person who is an expert at doing American Sign Language translation, interpreting, comes in, you are paired up, they help you communicate, it's all good. Not even close, the reality is when the deaf or hard of hearing individual first meets an interpreter for the first time, they are watching that person like a hawk. 
it's not an immediate trust because there are so many factors at play when you are trying to communicate. And ASL is a remarkable language where there is uh, it's a spatial language where you can form a sign that exists in a specific area and then you can refer back to that area later on. Um, there are new kind of terminologies that are introduced and then referenced with on-the-fly ad hoc signs. And of course, like any interpretation, you can never get perfect clarity the first time, so you're doing some personal interpreting, as you would imagine, where you're trying to convey the gist of it. You know, So before an individual who's deaf and hard of hearing goes to like a safety critical situation where they're talking to a doctor or a lawyer or whoever, they want to make totally sure that they've had three, four, five sessions with that same interpreter. Now, why do I bring this up? This is an example of a probabilistic system, human to human interaction. We have so much to learn, and I had so much to learn as somebody coming in just ready to, I was like, I think we can do some stuff to help you with machine learning. And then I walked away being like, I have to reassess many of my assumptions. <laughs> so, um, a colleague that I am privileged enough to work with, uh, Arthi Satsamadavan, has done this research to distill down um, what she describes as these three layers of uh, trust in AI systems, more, but more specifically, trust in probabilistic systems. So when we talk about human-to-human -human relationships, we have this wonderful pyramid structure that forms up, where the first step is understanding predictability. Can I more or less predict how this person is going to behave under these conditions? It's not about right or wrong. The prediction could be, I think this person's totally going to like fail on this. Like This is going to be the worst. But it's predictable nonetheless. Because with predictability, you can escalate to the next layer, which is dependability. Right? So if you can predict how well or what they're going to do in a specific context, then you can call on them or not call on them in the situations where those predictions would be useful. It's part of the relationship building process that we do without really even thinking. But where it has to escalate or is labeled escalate into that last frame of faith, that only happens if they actually demonstrate a capability, right? You've been able to predict that they do a thing, they do it well, you've been able to depend on them, and they've evidenced their ability to be dependable, and then you have faith. And at faith, you actually get to sort of forget about some of those underlying details and just say, hey, can you do that thing next week? And they'll be like, yeah, totally, and then you're done. But that clarity and that seamlessness of interaction when you've worked with somebody and you can trust them, we all cherish that, right? Like it's one of the huge things that we love about the people that we work with when we love the people we work with. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's perfect, but it means that when somebody falls down on something that you hoped they would follow through on, you're not left with like broken pieces. You have the architecture to rebuild and say, oh, I was depending on you for something maybe I shouldn't have been, and you have an opportunity to better clarify your relationship. Here's the problem with AI. We have this paradox, and on the left side is automation bias, which is this natural propensity that all of us have to over-rely on systems that are automated. You know, we've all heard the term like machine-like intelligence, or the idea that there's some objective perfection when these systems just give us their answers. And even when they demonstrate errors, we still over-rely on them. We've, done, we've all done it when we followed the GPS instructions that took us totally in the wrong direction. That was like, that's definitely a road closure, but it's telling me to turn. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and on the other side is the automation conundrum, uh, coined by Dr. Micah Ensley. And it's a wonderfully counterintuitive, except it makes total sense when you say it thing, which is the more accurate a system becomes and the more reliable that system becomes, the more it actually will harm you when it fails. Now the issue is that this is how we start with the AI systems, right? We start maxed out. Automation bias puts us here. We begin with full faith, and here we haven't defined, like we haven't agreed on the situation. We haven't, we haven't enough agreement in the data, in the model optimization goals, any of that stuff. We haven't been granular enough about its performance characteristics and how we're gonna evaluate its success. And then our users start here full of faith, and then when we let them down, it's a drop. And that drop is what has to change. And that's where ethics lives. So one of my favorite examples slash goofiest examples of this uh, is done by Projects by IF, which is a UK design firm that focuses on privacy and ethics. Um, this is, and this is real, helps you do uh, get insurance for your drone. You know, what a time to be alive. But <laughs> nevertheless, what they let you do is move a map around to see how it changes 
the score you get about your insurability and the danger of insuring within a specific zone. And what this allows is the user to develop their own functional mental model about risk. It's not just because, it's because there's tall buildings there, and so you shouldn't fly your drone around. You know, like there's things like that, but people get to build in that intuition. And going back to this example, there's a huge uh, uh, feedback closing, closing mechanism here that we love to try to encourage, which we sort of talk about as machine teaching. There's a whole world of opportunity when you open up, when you open up the, the failures under the hood. And there's a couple things I'll call out here. One, um, there's really, really good research about how to get, uh, get away from automation bias, but it takes a different approach to model training, which is providing a confidence threshold that it is a match alongside a confidence that it's not a match. This is not how most classifiers are trained. But if you actually are able to present both those things, it kicks in a system two kind of thinking, as Kahneman talks about. It forces us to wait, stop, and just avoid the knee-jerk reaction of accepting what the system told us, because we have to use our brains a little bit. And it's a different story if this were to say, you know, 95% confidence and 10 versus 80%, 80%. Right, that causes us to stop and question a little bit about whether and why we trust these things. But then there's even fun stuff, which is like, okay, can I just retry that one word? Or better yet, maybe it just didn't hear me right, and I want to teach it what I sound like. Because the unique characteristics of my voice, you know, transfer learning acoustic model of my unique attributes, with consent, is a really, really fun and engaging experience for people to feel like they get to teach the system, rather than just be beholden to its successes or failures. And there's one more. I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to do a little demo of this um, with a microphone up to my phone. So that's a phone. Um, so I'm going to show you Seeing AI, which is a, an app that's a computer vision based app uh, that's developed for people who are blind um, that our team actually owns. Um, and it's kind of the one outlier of our, our group. We do a lot of like partnering and co-creation, but then we also have this amazing group that built Seeing AI. So um, there's a lot of different functionalities that Seeing AI offers, um, things like the ability to recognize currency, so that before you go on a shopping trip, you can actually identify the different currency you want to put into your wallet and stack them in the right order. Um, it allows you to do short text recognition, so you can read documents. Um, but one of my favorite ones actually is light detection. So what you'll hear is a tone as I move to different uh, levels of light, and if I cover my camera, you'll hear it gets quieter. And that's because if you're using a computer vision-based system and the user is blind, they won't know if it's light or not. So if you want to stair-step on top of this automation, you actually have to first start by building confidence in self. And it allows us to uh, help, or allows the user to put themselves in a position where they can say, before I do the short text thing, or the person recognition thing, or the product recognition thing, make sure the lights are on. It's these things that we often forget when we're architecting the systems, the ways that people might need to make sure they feel they're doing it right before we give them the answer. All right, so in summary, uh, a couple things that I would just sort of, if I could snap my fingers and change. So this agreement problem, right? So uh, this is the difference between when we collect our data and we define our model optimization characteristics. We've said both the things that we expect should and the things that we expect should not affect that model's performance. It's a, again, it's a simple characteristic change, but it forces us to say out loud our assumptions. It's a huge difference in the quality of the performance and also the things that happen from an unfairness perspective, where uh, you're like, oh, that shouldn't have impacted it, but maybe you didn't call it to attention before you trained. The second, and this is just sort of like, I guess a drum that I want to keep on beating when I talk to people that work in like big kind of cloud, uh, uh, big cloud platform systems is actually I think we're winning when we're building more and narrower model models instead of just starting with generalizability. Because back to the points about you know affordance design, if everything is a generalizable model, but we don't have a clear line of sight into the specific context of, of use then we leave people in the lurch when they go to actually apply these systems in practice. Usually they just have to go on funny hacks. So instead, let's think about, just like we do with inclusive design, you start with the complex before you generalize. The same thing with machine learning, start with the complex before you generalize. Finally, the best examples I've seen of really functional machine learning UX is when we introduce a new type of a metric, and this metric is about people's confidence in themselves. 
You know, we say self-efficacy, and I've used the word fluency here. Because fluency really is like you use something with that when you kind of don't have to think about it. Like you reach for that tool, that word, um, because it's the right thing for the right place. And the difference of doing something like, hey, we've trained a model and we've improved, improved its performance by 8%, is a totally vacuous statement if you haven't actually proven that somebody is as effective or more effective with that new model. And study after study shows that it's really that kind of, hey, they moved my cheese, except it's invisible, right? Like the model just tells you that you, the thing you used to rely on has changed. So again, we need to have a different mindset about how we evaluate these, these uh, the criteria of a, of a useful MLUF experience. And with that, uh, I will wrap up this portion of lightning talks. They maybe weren't so lightning, but, um, but nevertheless, thank you again for having us and love to chat. Oh my gosh, those were so cool. Oh, this is such a treat. Even if y'all didn't show up, I was like, hey, you know what, Andrea and Josh, we're gonna have a great time. I cannot wait to hear about what y'all said. Look, and you got an audience for it this time. Um, I am just so inspired by the work both of y'all do, and I would love to invite you up here to join me. Ooh, ah, stage transition. Ooh, ah, feel free to grab your own chair, too. Um, hi, this is a free event. Um, do you want water? We have talking rain. Should I like, um, is there like a oh, different slide? Is that one? Fine. Do you yeah. want that one? Or? Uh, hi, um, we're casual here. Uh, I'll sit here, I think. We'll see what You're gonna put thing. me in the like projector screen? Yeah, you and Andrew can sit. Really yes. Bad. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. Anyways, just to recap, if you're coming in late, if you're like, wow, I'm so inspired, I forgot why I was here, and I just want to go work on cool stuff. The big reason why we're here is really to share these best practices, approaches, takeaways, bring them back to our teams, um, really showcase how ML and UX is approached at Getty Images, at Microsoft, um, and case studies just to help us understand this emerging field. And y'all have been amazing at tweeting in some questions, so big shout out to you. Thank you for doing that. Normally I'm like, okay, you can hear questions now. Nice. You did that, so thank you. Um, yes, so without further ado, uh, we're going to move into the question portion. This one's me, by the way. Looks just like a photo. Um, so, great. Oh, this is very high, too. Oh my gosh. Also, passing the mic back and forth is going to be awesome. There's one right there. Oh, uh, snap. Yeah, great. I'm going to lower this because this is. Hello. <laughs> um, okay. So, sorry, now I need to pull up all of my notes from where my questions were. One thing that I love is that Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you come from more of the design field. Andrea, you come from much more of the data science field. And both of you are up here talking about really important issues and how you approach things together. Um, but could you share just a little bit about like, what does it look like on the day to day? Like, how does a designer work with data scientists or how does a data scientist work with designers? <laughs> OK. <laughs> So yes, I work with, I hope some of the design and UX research team are in the room because I work with them a lot. Uh, it's, it's just when we, whenever we start to build any sort of machine learning model, we really want to make sure that we're solving the right problem that the customer is actually asking for and really making sure that we well understand the customer expectation of what the model is going to output. And so we do a lot of research with the user beforehand of faking what type of model output would be in a given feature, uh, coming up with completely Wizard of Oz mocks and doing the testing beforehand. Uh, also using working with uh, designers and UX researchers uh, to look into the training data. So. Uh, in building a model, we'll be collecting training data and putting some of that training data actually in front of customers and getting the reaction can give really good insights into uh, what, where, where our model is likely to go wrong as a, in the eyes of the customer. What does the day look like? Face looks are like all over the place right now. Um, the, the question about what is, you know, how the design background feeds in, I think is a really interesting one because, you know, I, I, the typical expectation for design and user research, I think in general, is around last mile. Um, 
And my like journey into this weird space has been just finding myself usually the only designer in the room. And that's actually why I sort of left and started doing something different. Um, because I feel like we need better shared language. Uh, I have a colleague who uses the term transdisciplinary. Um, because really it's a process of learning how to speak with each other, not just what the other disciplines do, um, but enough to feel like we can advocate for each of our disciplines. Where things break down is when we caricature each other. And you know, I have all sorts of questions or answers about sort of the day-to-day, -day, you know, like the operations that we've built up on our team. But I think to your point about discipline, um, totally agree. It's so much about the, the ways that foster better collaboration. We can talk more about it. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned that you want to talk more about it because there's definitely a lot of questions on Twitter about like how do you actually collaborate together? Also, sorry, hi, I try to do this on the fly where I combine like three Twitter questions in one. Um, so bear with me as I try to piece this together. So throughout the AI life cycle, and maybe Andrew, you could just share too, like what <coughs> the AI life cycle typically is. What are the touch points where UX can come in and add benefits? So there's figuring out what you're even going to build. Well, let me even step farther back than that. Um, really, I think so often it's easy to jump to some sort of machine learning as a solution or solving a problem, whereas uh, really it's understanding the customer problem and then looking at all the different ways that we can solve that. And often machine learning is not the answer. It's a pretty small percentage of the time that it actually is the answer. So really starting there is, is pretty critical. Um, once it's decided that a machine learning model actually makes sense in some way to power some feature, um, I loved the slide that you had up on the, um, it is like the different levels at which we're automating something or taking over control. And so thinking through uh, what is this model doing? Is it predicting something? Is it analyzing data in some way? Is it doing something completely automated behind the scenes? Or is there, does the, does the user or the human have an opportunity to change it in some way? And thinking through that influences what type of, um, both what type of model we're gonna build and also how accurate, how reliable does it need to be? And then we can think through what, what type of training data can we meaningfully get to represent the situation that we're trying to basically re recreate in some way or using the machine. So then it's creating the training data, building the model. Uh, usually we get some like V0 of the model and we want to start putting that, the results in front of customers and seeing how they respond, which can inform the training data that we want to go get, go and collect, or if we need to change our model in some way, uh, going through that iterative process, validating the model with whatever metrics we think are important to the user, and then actually putting that model into production. Thank you for summarizing the whole data science life cycle in like, like, like 20 minutes. But yeah, no, I'm super impressed. And um, yeah, what are some touch points too where UX can come in and like really add value? I mean, I would argue, well, almost everywhere except for the coding itself, I guess, <laughs> or the coding itself too, if you want, but like what the model is going to do is so dependent on what the user expects, uh, where you get your training data and what that, making sure the training data is representative of the users that are gonna be using the model in the end. If you use training data for one country, but this model is gonna be used in another country, then, then that's not, doing the job well. And so making sure that uh, UX conversations are happening at least at every point and uh, considering the user along the way is, I think, everywhere. I'll, I'll give a few examples. Um, so one, uh, exactly going back to the, to the data life cycle question, we asked teams right up front to fill in an intake questionnaire, and it's a pretty lightweight one. Um, and we've like even like reduced it over time because often it's just the basics like describe the the, sort of the, the elevator pitch for your product, uh, the intended users, the intended markets, uh, and the sort of capabilities and limitations. And one would hope that many of these things are sort of slam dunks, but they're not. Um, and what it offers us is this chance to add more clarity, um, or say add oxygen. 
the distance, like the distance between your training data and your model performance is the difference between how representative your, the context where the data were gathered from, the people they were gathered with, and the um, sort of the goals that you've identified. So for example, when we're working with like the, the Connect team, um, they wanted to ship an on-device model for skeletal tracking, and we were like, well, we don't know about the human body because we're UXers, but we're trying to learn about other things that we don't know. So we went and jammed with kinesiologists and physical therapists and asked them a bunch of questions. We did user research, and we identified characteristics of generalizable human movements that we could use in data collection to calibrate the system. Um, when we do work around fairness and face detection or um, any kind of self-labeling characteristics, um, we've done a giant meta-analysis about um, representation that doesn't rely on as many of the proxies that we use, like race and ethnicity, which are always just proxies for proxies, um, and try to get more specific. Um, so we've identified <coughs> specific starting points, and one is like ancestry, like geographic ancestry, um, gender identity, uh, age, there are things that we can actually, again, get closer into that perceived or independent category by talking to real people and seeing how they self-represent, and also the things that they feel um, are relevant given the context of use. Um, there's, again, there's so many fun stories, but it's all about like, how do you get closer and get more information? You get closer to the end user and get more information to fill in your demands of ignorance because we all have tons of them. And UX is a question asking discipline. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, kind of on that same note too, there is this question and um, a lot of positive feedback about like, yay, awesome, designing for diversity and like different voices. How do you make sure that those voices get represented in the room? Like what might some of those engagements look like? Um, do you have any tips or best practices across about working across disciplines or anything too? Yeah, I'll say, um, so one of the things that we require for every single engagement we take on is we have just kind of a, a team ethos that every project has to include one group that would not have been included in the default. Um, and the way that we go about doing that is through our arms assessments and through understanding the, the applications of use in the context. And then we forecast out the places where there are the people that are most likely to have been uh, not included, uh, potentially at risk, um, statistically underrepresented, or historically marginalized. And we, then we make them first class citizens in our user research. So every, everything in our engagement flow starts with user research where we over-index for folks whose voices are not traditionally part of the power user or early adopter group. Um, we bring that to the fore and we just you know, use that as our, our sort of challenge statement for ultimately what turns into recommendations where we file with product teams and say, here are the things that are going to cause active harm, uh, are likely to cause harm, uh, or ways that we can measure how proactive we are uh, as a company and as a product group. And those are channels starting from the groups who are, again, not in the, the mainstream. Uh, back to that, kind of checking our domains of ignorance as a team uh, and, and then filling it from there through advocacy. So great, I love that, I love all that. Um, I would say something that we do specific with training data with the model is we have the luxury of on our images, we have these keywords as I talked about in the talk. And so when we can do kind of a quick gut check of are we really heavily skewed in the type of training data that we have, so we can look over a million images all at once and see are we you know, 95% Caucasian in this set and we need to rebalance and reconsider that in some way. So that's not directly really talking with users, but it is a way for us to have, it's not perfect, but it's a sanity check to, to make sure that we're, we're checking our own biases. Awesome. Um, sorry, if I'm looking down at my phone, it's because y'all are tweeting in great questions, and I'm like, oh God, how do I find these? Um, so there is a question around like, you both are great, fantastic work that you do. Um, how do you encourage the other people that you work with <laughs> to consider the same things that, that you both are very passionate about, including um, ethics, society, culture, so much more in their work? Or do you have any processes or tips around that? Start. Uh, you mentioned in your talk uh, bringing in the 
Uh, ethics into the performance review as something that is a clear goal, it's measurable, it's something you talk about with your manager. That's something we're starting to look at for um, career ladders and how people are measured in any role that touches data of uh, not only are you building your hard skill set and your technical skill set, but you also need to be building the skill set around where are the biases in the data? Am I accounting for them in some way, whether it's the model that I'm choosing or manipulating the data? Am I also thinking about the context of where that data come from? Am I really asking uh, what, what are the biases of the system or the incentives of the system in which that data was generated or collected? And are there ways that um, we should be making sure that we're getting uh, more representative data from the system that it was created in? And, really um, everyone is responsible. Those that are really, really technical and are not strong in these places, they're also responsible too to really think about um, the, the larger context in which data is created and used. I think I'm hearing the like difficult stakeholder conversation in that question too. Um, like what happens when someone's like, yeah, but we're gonna ship it tomorrow, right? <laughs> so totally real thing. Um, looking at one of the people I work with a lot. Um, and like, just laugh. Because it's all, it's, it's always, like we're all gonna hear that. Um, and you're not gonna change that um, overnight. You're not gonna change it by telling people what to do. You're not gonna change it by telling them, talking at them or preaching or, you know, other other forms. Um, we found, I mean, this is, this is a human endeavor. This is a process of um, creating the space where we allow them to wear the skeptic's hat, where we allow them to wear their human being hat. Um, we really altered our direction from maybe more activist when we first started the scene to being more like, hey, let's just start by like talking about some of the things that we believe, like hopes and fears. And it doesn't, I know it doesn't sound like the super technical response or anything, but I think you and I both agree, like this is just about the people and feeling like we're all safe enough to ask the uncomfortable question. Um, and, and that's kind of our, all hallmark, our hallmark of success. And you know, we do like a, a you know, we do like a post engagement you know, feedback and um, we talk to folks about how they felt about it and um, what moves the needle is when we're not around and their, the engagement is finished and someone comes to them with that wacky idea about what to do Will they have the tools, the resources, the comfort, psychological safety with saying, I don't know about that, like, and have some questions for it. Um, and so that's been really gratifying to see. Um, it's, it's kind of there's a bit of therapy that goes into the work, I think, probably. Uh, <laughs> like, didn't realize it's okay to bring myself into this conversation because there's just so much pressure. Yeah, totally. And um, love it because these are very difficult things to be working in. So love that both of you are pointing out the difficulty of doing that. And you know what? The best way to do is try. So, um, Andrea, uh, I have a question for you. But Josh, my idea, which I meant, who knows? Um, so, so you talked about a lot of really great, like, um, motivations that your users might have for different images and stuff, too. Um, can you share a little bit about like how do you decide on out of all these things like you mentioned that photographers are like incentivized in different ways you mentioned like people are incentivized in different ways to pull different types of images and like things being captured how do you even know those things like how do you even measure that and like how do you even then go about making new products around that such a great question uh, I have no answers. <laughs> um, really, I mean, there are so many different uh, people involved, both the customer and then the photographer, as well as the, the company overall. And uh, it's really finding things that, that make everyone happy if we can. That's usually impossible, but really trying to find the best way to um, make sure that we're doing the best thing for, for all parties involved because at the end of the day, we we need all of that to to continue to move forward with uh, the imagery that we're trying to put out there. Do you have a better answer? <laughs> it's a loaded question. <laughs> well, okay, I have another question though. 
Um, so we have a lot of folks in the room. Who, how many of you are more in the UFC side of it? Oh, hi, welcome. It's nice to see you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, data science side, just about my head too. Ooh, a lot more shyer hands. I don't know what that is about. But, um, okay, cool. Uh, there's a lot of like, hey, MLUX, very different than typical UX, right? Yes, no, how is it different? I don't know, like what do I need to learn? I, do either of you have tips or tricks? Like how does it MLUX, focusing on these AI, ethics, I don't know, all this other stuff that MLUX entails, how is it different than traditional UX? How's it different? The first thing I usually tell people is you're already an expert. Um, so that's the, that's like the ingress point. Like if you've ever taught anybody anything ever, you already know machine learning. Um, you probably just don't have the words for it. Um, when we're doing a, you know, we're doing some hiring processes and understanding about um, how we think about the various attributes of folks that we want as we're building out this new kind of thing, um, it really comes down to curiosity. So uh, fundamentally, the rules are still there. The human-centered design process is 100% the same. Understand, define, prototype, validate, you know, like it's, it's all there. There are differences that come in the form of um, asking new questions about things like sources of data, um, there are differences that come from understanding different types of models and their different benefits. You can just stay more up to date with current trends. When it comes to ethics, that certainly means we have to separate out like the parts of our team's channel that are like, here's all the sadness in the world, which like the part that are like, here's really interesting innovation because it can be intense, all the crazy things people are trying to build with AI. Um, and we have to stay strong with the belief that it's possible to build a better future if all of us just get to ask more questions and build in a way that's more proximate to the human experience. So that's really the, the primary thing um, is about teaching the right sort of lexicon. Uh, we have a habit of doing a lot of acronym uh, defining on the team, like understanding policy, like attorney-client privilege, and um, you know what, what does it mean to actually operate in that space? Um, how do we define, what, how does policy get made? Well, it gets made up, made when someone invents something out of thin air and it sticks enough. You know, it's not magic. There's no perfect person who's a policy expert. You invent something in a principled way that can be adjudicated in a consistent enough fashion that somehow meets the needs that allows us to say, with our heads held high, we did a thing and we did it for a reason. Um, and that is something UX is great at. So. It really is more just broadening out the, the toolkit, um, but um, really when it comes to looking for folks on the team, starting with that solid foundation in, in human-centered design, is that is the requirement, um, because everything else from there is hyper-teachable. Yeah. Something that I see different a lot that you mentioned in your talk was the probabilistic nature of machine learning. Uh, in, in traditional software, it's pretty well controlled, all the different possibilities that can happen. With machine learning, that just, it's an endless number of possibilities of results that can be given to the user or situations that the user can find themselves in. And so really as a UX researcher or designer of how do you consider, like in, in design there's always this idea that you build something and uh, people will use it in unexpected ways, so there's always that level of uncertainty, and then I think that that is greatly exacerbated when it's, I don't even know what my own product or feature is going to do or act in a certain way, and then I also don't know how the, the user is going to respond to that, and so uh, really shifting the mindset to seeing the, the much, much wider ways um, or situations that can happen and trying to test for those, trying to design for those. Awesome. Well, um, there were so many good questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. A lot of very technical questions, too. So I invite you to come up and talk to our students as well. We'll hang out for a little bit after this, right? Yeah, come chat with them. They're cool. They're nice humans. Um, with all these events, I love to wrap up with one final question, one final thought. Um, you have a captive audience here, of uh, practitioners in the field, whether we are students or teachers or people actually building these products. Um, what would be like one tip, best practice, keyword, advice that you'd like to leave us with to help inspire us in our own practice? 
Uh, curiosity is what's coming to mind of just being like digging into these things that you don't know or you don't understand. There's some words, there's some jargon, machine learning, AI, there's sometimes these scary words, people get timid or feel like they don't understand. Um, there's a, there's just so much to learn and so much is changing and just being hands on and digging in and, and ready to learn even if you uh, aren't technical or aren't good with ethics or aren't good with with whatever you think you're not good at, just, just dig in and start learning. Uh, social contract. Uh, the the number one thing that I find myself uh, experiencing in this industry is it's like everything is an emerging technology and everything's brand new and so we're starting from scratch, right? And we're like, no, definitely not. We are rooted in society. There are existing social contracts and social norms that we actually can start from and operate in a much healthier way. Uh, and the example here is like data and data access, right? AI flows from data, like we talked about. Um, but the you know the pipeline comes from people, and we have some weird disconnects where in traditional social contracts between people there is an agreement that uh, when we enter into a shared space we can pay attention to each other for certain reasons, but it's certainly impolite to just stare at someone and record everything they're saying. Probably illegal. Um, in the same way, if I walk up to like the bank teller and swipe my card, they have ephemeral access to look at my bank account, ephemeral being the key, right? There's an expectation that I have a, a contract that they can look at something very personal about me for a limited period of time, and after I walk away, that access is rescinded, and our social contract is ended. But in AI, because of its hunger for data, and because people, the end users, have not been versed in all the legal jargon that folks who are versed in legal jargon are versed in, have unknowingly uh, agreed to all sorts of contracts that are misaligned with our social contracts. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that we have to flip the default from something like what the EU is saying with you know, rights be forgotten, and instead start with the rights not be remembered in the first place, mm -hmm. which is honoring those social contracts and honoring that when you ask someone to give up their precious data, which are the things that we should pay attention to, um, that it's been done so willingly, uh, with understanding, uh, with compassion, uh, and in a way that honors the social contract you would want to have with them when they fully come to realize what it is that you are doing with their data. Love it. Thank you both so much for your time. Can we give our speakers another round of applause? sharing your wisdom with us. Um, big thank you to all of our volunteers, um, Anmal, Jira, who are down working the table downstairs where all the fun was happening up here, thank you. Um, and to all the folks who are taking photos for us too, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this is our first event in Seattle, surprise, I don't know if you came in later, whatever. Um, so having y'all step up as volunteers last minute is crucial, and so just we thank you so much. Oh, and um, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you too, because I know that so many of us work a full-time job and it's a lot to then come after work hours and many of us have small children and family. So um, just thank you for, for taking the time to be here to be present with us and really do hope that um, this event doesn't end with us all being picked up in the images tonight, but I hope you get to connect with someone cool and this is for you, Seattle. This is in your own community, so meet these people, they are here. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free. We have social hour now, so feel free to say hi, Mabel, and yeah. Take, oh, email me if you're interested in hosting another one. Hey, what up? Um, take care, bye y'all. <laughs>